Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Thank you for being with us. My guest at this time is Willie Woods, a veteran of the historic Montford Point Marines, the first all African American unit ever created by the U.S. Marine Corps. He joins me now to tell his story and the significance of the Montford Point Marines. And Willie, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Let's start with your growing up years. Where were you born and where did you grow up? How did you eventually become interested in military service? Well, I'm originally from South Carolina, a small, small place called Chester. And I came to Washington, D.C. around 1932. Grew up in the lower northwest section of Washington, attended school in, in D.C. Basically, I just had a normal, you know, normal childhood life. I didn't do anything special. I, I loved sports, so we we had neighborhood teams. Then, you know, we were like your neighborhood. Maybe you lived three or four blocks over from me. You would play our neighborhood, uh, and uh, we, you know, this is this was our entertainment for that time. How old were you when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor? And what do you remember your reaction being at, as a young person? Well, I was about, I guess I was around about 16 or 17. And at the time that the attack took place, I was working at a, a pharmacy up on 14th Street. I didn't know anything about Pearl Harbor. Or, that wasn't a part of my history. I didn't, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't had any dealings with Pearl Harbor. When the news came on the radio, everybody was saying the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. And I didn't really find out what it meant until the following day. When I came home, uh, I, was, I was a delivery boy at the, uh, at, the, at the pharmacy. You call up and order something, you know, and I'd take the, make the delivery. We re I realized that, because the next day, the president President Roosevelt had said that you know, we were going to war, and that's when it really, you know, when when it really became. Uh, I, I really knew what was going on, and when when the president said that the United States was going to war with Japan, and from then on, it was just uh, I don't know. I, it was just well normal life, but. Things got a little different because, because of the war, everything went. We had this rationing. Uh, every food was rationed, and gas was rationed. You had to get gas stamps in order to get gas. Well, it didn't make any difference to me because I didn't have a car anyway. But food, the food part, and you, and you even had to get stamps to get shoes and so forth. But when I turned 18, I had to register for the draft. And that's when it really came, you know, when it really hit me. I, I, I knew what was going on then because I, 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 was, I was anticipating going into the military, but yet I was skeptical of going into the military because some people went and didn't come back. And I, this, this part was, was kind of frightening, but I was, I was excited that I had reached draft age and had my draft card in my pocket. But uh, it was a, it, it was, it was normal. It was nothing, you know, nothing special about it, but just the, just the, the thought of going to war. I was glad of one thing, though. I was glad that the war was being fought where it was. It wasn't here. We weren't affected you know, with the actual war itself, we were, we were like on the sideline because we didn't have to face the war here. And that part, we, we, that part of it, the, the only effect that I really had from that, from that was, a, and we used to have blackouts. You would put screens, not screens, but, uh, black paper across your windows to keep the light out and they had wardens had what they call air raid wardens 
it was like it was just like a school practice of a fire drill. Only we did it from inside the house. You you stayed inside rather than go outside. On the fire drills you came out, but on on these air raid warden air raid drills, you closed the house up so that no light could be seen. I guess this was because if planes came over, they they could see the light and you would more or less be directing the planes to what, what way they could go. But it, it was to keep the light out and we, during times like this, we didn't have TV or anything like that. We had, had radio, we'd be in the house and the only thing that you could do was to listen to the radio or get a book and read. But most people cut the lights out in the house even after they had put the the, 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 the cover up to the window to keep the light out, keep the light in, rather. When you turned 18 and became eligible for the draft, were you already aware of the Montford Point Marines, and that, is that why you decided to join them, or did, how did you go about deciding? No, well, there serve? was no Montford Point Marines until uh, President Roosevelt signed that bill. I, I can't think of it. It was in '42 when he signed the bill that the Montford Point Marines would be established. And actually, the Montford Point Marines, it was set up more or less as an experiment to see, well, the, 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 I'll say the old Corps felt that the black Marines, the black, well, not black Marines, but that the blacks were not really fit to be Marines. They felt that if, uh, we were pulled into the services. In fact, all the services were segregated at that time, but that was a way of life. But they felt that if we were brought into the military, that we wouldn't be able to carry out the function. We wouldn't be able to hold up to the high standards of the Marines. And now that wasn't the reason I chose the Marine Corps. The, re the real, real reason I chose Marine Corps when I was dragged, the day I went down for induction, you had to go down for a pre-induction exam to find out if you were physically fit to go into the Marine Corps, and to go into the services, really. But, but on the day that I went down, we had to go over to Baltimore to the armory. The, the quota for inductees for the Navy was 17 to one for Army and I don't think Marine Corps even had a quota, but it was 17-1 for, 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 for the uh, Navy. And I did not want to go in the Navy. I didn't want to go in the Navy because I didn't like the outfits they wore. And I had, I, I, I wanted to go into the Army, but I figured if I opt for the Marine Corps, then I would probably get Army. I was, I was trying to weigh my odds for getting into the Army. So I chose Marine Corps. And there were only uh, two, there were only two of us from D.C. who opted for the Marine Corps. And we were taken, and there was one from Baltimore, and we were taken to her this colonel's office, he was uh, an inductor, uh, 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 the one who gave us our induction exam and whatever. But he, but he was old core, and he was hard old core. He was determined to me, it seemed, to tell us that we didn't want to go in the Marine Corps, that that was a bad choice. He, all of his, there was, there was no invitation to come on, you're welcome. The whole, the whole thing seemed to be you were being pushed aside, pushed off, and given information that would try to kind of pull your spirits down. But we looked at each other and listened to him, and when he had finished his little induction speech, he asked us, do you still want to go? And we told him yes. 
So there were three of us at that time that had chosen the Marine Corps, and we, were, we became Marines at that time. We had a chance to come back home that night and report back to the Army the next day. And then we were given uh, orders. This was received, but the first orders we were re would, would receive were, were from, we got written orders from, to take us to catch a uh, train at Union Station and go to Richmond, Virginia. And then from there, we caught a bus to Warsaw, North Carolina. And from Warsaw, North Carolina, we went to the Marine, the Marine base at Montford Point. Now, I had never heard of Montford Point until that time. In fact, the first, the first I'd heard of it was when the, the colonel said you'd be going to Montford Point. And to me, that was just, just a name, you know. But we went and the, well, during that time, segregation was everywhere. There was, uh, everywhere you went, you just about, you saw signs that directed you to where. They, they had signs colored in white or colored not wanted in here, you know, colored not served here, something of that sort. But anyway, we went to Warsaw. Had, we had a little wait over in Warsaw to wait for the bus to come to take us on to Montford Point. And now the, the, the DC, DC was segregated too, you might as well admit it. But it wasn't, it wasn't something that would hit you in the face every day because you lived in your area and other people lived in their area and the two never really came together to, you know, for, for any, anything any, any uh, I'll say, disagreements to come up. But uh, when, when we got to Warsaw, it was early in the morning, and we had picked up one more fellow from, in Richmond from, I think it was Natural Bridge, Virginia. He was from Natural Bridge, Virginia. We had picked up one more, one more Marine from Natural Bridge, and there were now, were now four of us. And when we got to, to Warsaw, we were hungry. So the bus driver showed us where we should go to wait to get something to eat. It was a place not as big as this room here, where they had a pot belly stove in the middle of the floor and benches on the side around two sides of the, of, the, of, the, of the room. And in the front of the room, there was a, a window about maybe a foot and a half square where you could order food from inside what, was, what seems to be a drugstore. And well, back then at that time, they had, you had the counters where you go in and you could get the drugstore. Well, drugstores were hangouts for kids anyway. But we had to order from back behind. In fact, you couldn't even see in the place good. You could see that it was set up. It was, it was, it was pretty nice over there compared to what was on this other side. But we, were, we, were, we ordered food, and I don't know if they had any hot sandwiches or not, but our, our sandwiches were cold. And then we waited for the bus, and from there we went to North Carolina to uh, Montford Point, North Carolina, where it was just outside of Jacksonville. Well, let's, sir, let's uh, take a pause there. We're talking with PFC <coughs> Willie Woods, a member of the historic Montford Point Marines. I'm Greg Columbus. This is Veterans Chronicles. We'll be right back. We are back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm <coughs> Greg Columbus. I'm joined today by PFC Willie Woods of the historic Montford Point Marines. That is the first all-African-American unit in the history of the U.S. Marine Corps, established by President Roosevelt in 1942. Prior to the break, uh, Willie was telling us about his journey down to Monford Point after deciding to join the Marine Corps when he turned 18. And, Willie, what year was this when you got to Monford Point? 
1945. 1945. So the war was nearing an end, although it was you probably near, didn't know it at that time. It was. It was coming. It was, the war was coming to a close. Mm -hmm. In fact, before we finished boot camp, no, it was after boot camp because we had gone into combat training. And before we finished combat training, uh, the war ended, and the combat training was deactivated. Everything was deactivated, and we were all put in units to go overseas. And so you were assigned to the 49th Marine Depot Company in October of 45, correct? That's right. And what type of work did that unit do? Well, it was, it was a service unit, and uh, actually it was set up to bring ammunition from behind, from, from you know, up to the front lines. It was set up to, to serve the people who served the actual combat vets, combat soldiers, you know, combat I'm calling them soldiers. I know they're getting me now, <laughs> but it was it was we, we we were we were we were the waiters who served the people who were up at the front doing the, doing the battle. But at that time the war was over, so we were more or less a cleanup crew to come behind and whatever 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 work that was to be done. We we probably got the assignment to, you know, uh, my, 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 my job as uh, had been mail orderly for each unit that I had been in up to that time. And that was because of the experience I had had back as a civilian. I was working in mail and I was a mail orderly so I kept that service number that I kept as a mail orderly. And when uh, they didn't really need me as a mail orderly because the, the, the office, the, the, the clerks in the office took over that responsibility, I was assigned to out in the field, whatever assignments came up. One assignment I had was guard duty. It was a warehouse area where they stored food, food, or uh, whatever, whatever food that came on the island was more or less stored in this unit. In fact, it serviced a third division, Marines, Marines third division, uh, the eighth ammo division, which was an ammunition company. That was a black company, but, this, but this, the, the third Marine division was the white Marines. And I was, I had, I had a Jeep patrol where I would ride around these big warehouses and just to watch to see that nobody came in. You know, and it's a funny thing about that. When I was doing this duty, <clears throat> I was never told what I would do if I caught somebody going in. I don't know where I would have taken them or who I would have given them to. I was just told to watch it. But, and there was a, there was a second lieutenant. I never will forget him. I never knew him. I never really met him. But whenever I was on duty, I, I guess he might have messed with some of the other guys too, but whenever I was on duty, he would come in his Jeep and park at one end of the warehouse area and wait until I came around in my Jeep. And then he would take off and he knew I was going to chase him. And he also knew that I couldn't catch him because my Jeep had a governor on it and it would only do, I guess, about maybe 35 or 45 miles an hour. And his Jeep didn't have a governor on it. So he knew there was no chance of me catching him. If I had caught him, I didn't have anything to do with him anyway. Because he was a lieutenant and I was a PFC. But the, the best duty I had on Guam was as a POW guard. I had a detail of 17 guys, and I would take the 17 and go to the POW stockade and check out prisoners of war, the Japanese prisoners of war. And I would get anywhere from 200 to 500 men, and the other units on the island from the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, wherever, who needed personnel, you know, 
the uh, labor from the prisoners would come and check those prisoners out from me. Now here I am, a PFC, and I'm with all these men, and I'm now, I had to check them out, had to, had to make sure of a head count before they go out, and had to have a head count when they came in. I, I thought, I always did think it was too much for me, but I made it, you know, and but I, 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 I just couldn't see why a PFC had to have that much responsibility. But it, 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 was, it was a good detail. I, I really enjoyed it. You know, I, 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 I made friends with some of the Japanese prisoners, and we had a guy who had been a professor of English in, at Tokyo University. He was one of the prisoners, and he was my right-hand man because I didn't speak Japanese, but he spoke perfect English, and he would make sure that all my paperwork was in, was in shape. And each, each morning when I came over, he was the first one I'd look for. They call, we called him the professor. And he would check, he helped me check the prisoners out, and then we had gone. In fact, I kept the professor with me all day long, because any time something come up, if I, if I couldn't communicate with the Japanese, I, you know, I couldn't get my point across. But he was, he, he was really, he was, he was really a nice little fellow. And I, I, I appreciated him. And I, and I think he, he kind of liked me too, I believe. You know, he, he was a pretty good guy. Let me hold you right there, sir. We'll take another break and learn more about the uh, military career of Willie Woods and get his thoughts on the historic significance of the Montford Point Marines. We'll be right back on Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. I'm honored to be joined today by Mr. Willie Woods, a member of the historic Monford Point Marines, the first all African American unit in the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, when we left off our conversation at the end of the previous segment, uh, Willie was telling us about some of his experiences as he was stationed in Guam. And Willie, uh, as you think about the rest of your time there and some of your other assignments, as a member of the Marine Corps, what comes to mind most? I guess mostly is being processed to, to return to civilian life. I only stayed in the Marine Corps a little over, well, approximately two years. And at the time that I was in, the, they, they had to, it, there were two Marine Corps really. One was the white one and one was what they called a colored one back during that time. And we had had several uh, men from Montford Point to go to Quantico uh, Officers Training School. And they had all been flunked out. Uh, the, as I said, when I first started this, this was uh, an experiment and the experiment was really set up to fail, as, as, as I see it now, because there were no, the highest rank at that time in the black part of Marine Corps, which was the one that was called colored, was sergeant, field sergeant major. And it was, it was a thought of the higher officers in the Marine Corps, ones who had the controlling word, who had the main say, that there would be no, you know, no, no, colored, no, no colored officers. But there was a, one young man who I had, I, I had had the pleasure of going through, of starting, but we didn't really finish, started combat training with him, a fellow named Branch. And when Branch went to OCS and Quantico, he was the first one to really finish. He was the first black officer, second lieutenant, that was commissioned in the Marine Corps. And now Branch was, he was a quiet fellow. He, was, he wasn't a, a guy, he wouldn't stand out in a crowd. But he was a fellow who had 
determination. He, if he started something, he was going to finish it. And I guess at the time that he went to Quantico, they had plucked out so many that they were down to the last straw and said, well, we're going to let this one through. But I don't believe they could have kept Bratch from graduating. Bratch was determined he was going to make it, and he, and he made it. And this is, what, this is what opened up the Marine Corps. When I was drafted, I didn't think of myself as being somebody out front doing something that was really necessary and something that would be a part of history. I didn't think of myself as being one of one of a group, you know, or any, any I didn't I didn't connect myself to history at all. But now I can look back on it and even though I'm a small part of that history, I can feel good about just being that little small part, just to get a little niche in there where I can say and I can tell my children and my grandchildren that I did serve and I was a part of the beginning. It wasn't, it's not that I ran into a whole lot of segregation, a whole lot of uh, bigotry or anything like that while I was in the service. But the fact that after Branch came out of Quantico, things kind of opened up, it seems, for all branches of the service. It's true, Harry Truman, President Harry Truman, signed a bill to desegregate the entire military, all to all the military services. And after that, everybody was grouped together. So I can see where the Montford Point Marines were like a spearhead for all of this that opened up after that. And I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of that. But I'm not one to boast about it or, you know, to, I, I can stick my chest out, but I stick it out to me, not, not to let the world see it, but I, I stick it out to me and say, I'm a part of a big thing, though it's a, I'm a real, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a small thing, but I'm a part of this great big thing, and that, that makes me feel good. About the only thing that, uh, only segregation that happened as far as I was concerned while I was in the service was when I was ready for discharge. In fact, I had really been discharged, but I, they, you know, you, they give you a discharge date that they set ahead of time and you're still in the military until that date arrives. But I was, we, the, the group that I was discharged in that came north we chartered a bus from Jacksonville, North Carolina to Richmond, Virginia. And the only, the only, the only uh, person on that bus other than, the, other than us Marines were the driver, it was a bus driver. And he was white, but that, you know, that didn't make any difference. But when we got to Richmond, we ran into a soldier who was headed, well, this, this bus was chartered from Richmond, actually, to D.C. And we, we, we ran into a soldier who needed transportation from Richmond to D.C. And he had missed his, he had missed his bus some kind of way, and he needed a ride to get on to D.C. So he asked the bus driver, could he, you know, catch a hop on the bus? Because we did have some vacant seats. And the bus driver told him, he said, well, it's not up to me to say. So these guys chartered this bus, and it's up to them whether you can ride or not. 
we didn't care whether he, you know, rode with us or not. But we said, yeah, you can come on. Just, you know, you can ride. You're welcome. And this, this young man had enough nerve to ask for a front seat on the bus. And it brought stares from everybody that was on the bus. And we looked at him and say, if you need a front seat, yeah, you can have a front seat just to get on the bus, you know. And because I, I, I it still amazes me that the guy would have that much nerve to ask for this, for a front seat on the bus after he had gotten a free ride. But he did. And, but, and I don't think a word was spoken about it all the way from Richmond to D.C. It was just the fact that he rode with. In fact, we, we probably didn't even think about it because we were so happy to be on that bus going home. And didn't, it didn't even phase us. But just to know that somebody had that much nerve. But my, my, my Marine experience was one I never will forget it. It'll be with me as long as I live, and I'm proud of it. I'm really proud of the fact that I was a Marine. They say once Marine, always a Marine. I'm still, I guess I'm still some, some, some part of me. I might not be a whole Marine, but I'm still some part Marine. And that, that's a, a proud thing. In fact, I got a little stand at home now that I got all my little paraphernalia, you know, on it that connected with this we're with the Marine Corps, and they have some of my gear down at Quantico now in the in Marine history down there. They have have a, a, the emblem that I wore through church through boot camp. In fact, I wore it all the way through my military service, and they have a, the cap, my cap that I I, I trained in and a money belt that I wore all during boot camp. That money belt got a little story behind it because I had just drawn my last pay. I was working for the Navy Department and I had just drawn my last pay from the Navy Department and the money that I had collected, had, had drawn included leave that I had accumulated. And I had, I had about $300 in that money belt, and I trained with that $300 strapped around my waist. I guess I didn't trust the PX to keep my money because you had to take it, if you had valuables, you took it to the, to the, and checked it in at the PX and you could get it when you finished training. But that money belt carried me through boot camp. In fact, I carried that money belt through boot camp. I, I, I slept with it. The only time I took that thing off was when I took a shower. But uh, they have that and a little bio just down on display down in Quantico. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of that, just to say that somebody's going to be able to read that and see it if after I'm gone, you know. I, that, that's, that, that's, that's a star in my crown, really. What was it like knowing that when you grew up there was obviously a segregated armed forces to the point where your unit, this historic Monford Point Marine unit, was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. Well, now that was, it was a surprise. Actually, by not, I was not a member of the Marine, Monford Point Marine Association, so I wasn't up to date on what was going on. My wife happened to see something on TV about the gold medal was going to be awarded. And she checked into it and found out that, you know, that it really was coming off. So we went to, we found out, we got news, got, got information on where the Montford Point Marines met and so forth. And we went to one of the meetings. And from then on, it was all uphill for, for the, you know, for the medal. And I really, I, I, really, I was surprised to get it. I'm proud to have it, and can't nobody take it from me. But that was that. That was the, the 
for the, for, for the little time that I spent in the Marine Corps, that was the apex, that was the top thing to happen for me, according to you know, concerning the Marine Corps. And I, from that, it has brought on some experiences that uh, I wouldn't have had. In fact, I wouldn't be here for this interview had it not been for that congressional, congressional you know, medal. And I've been, I've had had the opportunity to, to tour the Commandant of the Marine Corps' home. In fact, I have a picture home now of the Marine Corps mascot, the, the, the dog, the bulldog, sitting on my foot at the end, down at 8th and I at, at Marine Barrack, I have a picture of that dog sitting on my foot with s some of the other Marfa Point Marines, you know, in the picture. And to know that there are only, say, 400 plus, uh, le le well, I'll say 500 minus because there are not 500 of us left, and to be to be one of that five, that four hundred, is it, it? It makes you feel proud. And every time you hear of one of those, you know, passing on, I guess it, it touches me, and I guess it touches the rest of the other guys who are part of it too, because they, you know, that your number is dwindling down, and. It's a number that you can't you can't build on it anymore. It's always going to be going down until there's none. So it's proud to be a part of that, and I, I want to stay a part of it as long as I can. Uh, it, it, it's it's a good feeling, and it it's something you when you can say <clears throat> that I have something that most people can't get. It's you know. That medal is the one thing that I have that most guys, even most Marines, will never get. You know, so it's it it it, it, it it's one of those things where, like I said about sticking your chest out, it makes you stick your chest out not to the world but to yourself, and say, I'm I'm a part of this. You know, but. It sounds like you're talking to yourself, which you really are, when you're when you 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 you're convincing yourself that you you have to convince yourself that you are part of it. Because sometimes it's it's more than you you know it's more than you bargain for, and it's hard to believe. But the experiences I've had uh, as being a Montford Point Marine, I'm really proud of it. I wouldn't swap it, change it, barter it, or I wouldn't sell it for anything. It's, it's something that I have and a few others, and I know that those others are just as proud as I am. And just Some of them like to tell war stories, but I don't have any war stories to tell because I, 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 didn't, I didn't fire one single shot. Uh, during the war, but those silent shots that I fired are still being heard because I took the training and I'm a part of the proof that, as they called us back during that time, colored, that the colored could serve with the white. And I was talking about the first black officer I didn't really realize until this Congressional Medal thing came up that the Marine Corps had advanced as far as it has, as far as being integrated. I, I didn't know that they had black generals. In fact, the only black officer I had seen was when I was in Pearl Harbor on vacation and saw the black marine uh, colonel on board the ship, on board the USS Arizona that we that we toured while we were down there. That was the first time I had, first one I had seen, 
And I was so surprised at his rate. You know, he had that he his rank. He had had an eagle on. I said, Lord, he had, you know, this man got an eagle on, and when I saw him, the best they could get was a brass ball. It was, in fact, didn't have but one brass ball. So it's come a long way. I want to thank you so much for being our guest today. Congratulations on your accolades. Thank you for your service to our country, and thank you for being our guest. I today. thank you for having me. Willie Woods, Private First Class, Monford Point Marines, the historic first all-African-American unit of the U.S. Marine Corps. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, where are at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.